and um, today we're going to talk about uh, publishing and um, the publishing industry and uh, value creation within the publishing industry. And if you talk to any publisher and ask him or her, um, how are you doing? How's business doing? They would always tell you that, you, that they're all, almost starving. And they would tell you this now. They would have told you 10 years ago, 50 years ago, and 100 years ago. And I think melancholia is part of the publishing system. So <laughs> don't believe everything that you read or hear from publishers. Today we're going to um, talk about um, one special aspect of the industry, which is um, value creation. And um, I would like to start with the product, um, the value chain, then um, examine a bit the single parts of the chain and how they're affected by change at this moment. And um, then we also have time for questions. And in between, if there's anything that um, you don't understand um, or would like to ask or would like to mention, please um, give me a sign. Some basics. When we talk about publishing, we talk about book publishing, not news publishing. That's important. Um, what is book publishing? It's basically all content that used to be between two pieces of paper mache. It's by Pappdecke in German. And is now available in all different digital or printable formats. It can be literature, it can be non-fiction, education content, self-help, scientific databases, scientific books, travel, and so on. What many people don't know is that publishing is um, the biggest sector within the European creative industries with a retail turnover of 40 billion euro per year. Worldwide, the publishing sector is worth 100 billion, that's the market value, um, estimated by the International Publishers Association for 2013. And the biggest markets are the US with 27 billion, followed by China with 15 million and an astonishing growth rate of 9 to 10% every year. Then Germany, which is the third biggest market, worldwide with 9.5 billion euros. And we also see at this moment a shift. The traditional publishing industries are very, very strong in um, the US, the UK, and in Germany. Right now we're shifting towards Asia. China, as I said before, is an important um, country due to its growth rate at this moment, and to, due to the growing middle class. But also Indonesia has a growth rate within the publishing industry at this moment of 17%, um, which means that there's a whole new class of people starting to read now and starting to buy publishing products. Also, a lot of innovation is created in Asian countries. For example, everything related to mobile publishing is especially strong in Korea and in Japan. If um, I happen to be in Korea quite, quite a few times every year, and if you um, ride on the subway there, you see everybody with their cell phone. Everybody's reading on their cell phone or playing games on their cell phone. And um, I was really excited to see that people are actually reading books and uh, not only surfing um, the web or, or watching videos. Um, so ebooks are interesting enough for Koreans to buy them, to download them to their cell phone and to read them. I also discovered a, an interesting service which is called Neighbor. Neighbor is a service provider in South Korea and um, they invented a new genre which is called webtoons. And webtoons are basically manga, it's a streamed manga that is in a very long form that you can scroll it. And um, you don't buy it, it's um, uh, financed by advertising. Um, you just go to the website and then you read the manga which destroyed half of the manga publishing industry in South Korea within three years. So um, change is happening pretty fast in this industry, and we're going to look at some of the changes. This is a graphical documentation that we did um, in a workshop at Franklin Book Fair. We um, invited several publishers to talk about new business models and, and the changes within the industry, and we had someone who um, took graphical notes, and it looks a bit chaotic. And um, actually, the industry is amidst heavy chaos <laughs> at this moment. <coughs> so this is nothing astonishing. The publishing industry has been disrupted for the last decade pretty heavily. 
Amazon came 20 years ago and they took over 25% of the market share in Germany and the US it's even more. Big companies like Borders, which was the second largest book chain in the US, had to file for bankruptcy three years ago because um, their revenues within four years went half, which is um, horrible for them. All the big publishing houses have heavily invested into digital business models, but so far there are no big revenues. So a lot of the big publishing houses are asking themselves, how much more do we have to invest until we see revenues? But don't get me wrong, the industry is doing well. The book industry as a whole is far from dead, even if it's changing a lot in some single parts. Actually, the industry is full of innovations at this moment. It has very stable print sales. Just, they just shifted to different parts of the industry. There are many new startups at this moment being funded, and Frankfurt Book Fair, as the most important professional event that um, the industry has, um, has a steady visitor number of 300,000 people coming from 110 countries. So this all shows that the industry is alive. There's a lot of things happening at this moment. And I also think that chaos is actually a good thing. Because um, out of this chaos, new things can evolve and companies and people who run the companies are open for innovations and are open for new things. But publishing is struggling to find a way into the future at this moment and um, I would like to have a short look at the product first. If you were dead, 1,500 before Christ, your family would go to a market and they would visit a book of the dead seller. So they would go to this shop and they would ask them to show you what book of death they had in stock because they were pre-produced. Of course, the production time for a book like this is pretty long, which means that you have to pre-produce it and the spaces where you put in the name of the dead person were left blank. So you go to the dead book seller, book of the dead seller, and you tell them the name of the person deceased, and then they would fill it in, and you could buy that book of death. Um, the book was given to the grave, and it was actually, it, it contained advice for life after death. So it told you things about what kind of gods you're meeting there, how to behave after your death, find your way around. So it was basically a self-help book, and what you bought, the content, was the container. 3,500 years later, <laughs> there was a movie with Meg Ryan and a very young Tom Hanks, and it's probably the most famous bookstore movie, that's why I selected it. And um, in this movie, Meg Ryan runs a small bookstore, and Tom Hanks runs a big bookstore chain. And he's driving her into bankruptcy, but then they fall in love, and then she runs his job, his, his shop and all that. But what's interesting about that movie is that the book is the same object as 3,500 years ago. The content is the container. And the content had been the container for 3,500 years. A book is a collection of stories, it's a collection of content that is bound together to preserve the context of that content and the order. You could not separate them. You could not go to a bookstore and say, I'm only interested in the content. I'm not interested in the object itself. My bookshelf is full. That wouldn't be possible. Until 22 years ago, Sony invented a new product which is called the electronic book player. It is a pretty interesting, or it used to be a pretty interesting concept at that time because it was the first ebook reader. It was introduced in 92 and Sony marketed it to travelers but also to students. So the pre recorded book discs that you could buy were um, basically electronic reference dictionaries, for example, but also novels. And it had a grayscale LCD, it had some audio input and output. 
and you could even type queries on the keyboard to find out to, to find something in databases. But it was not a big success, unfortunately. Maybe because um, the time was not right for electronic books. But we can see that 22 years ago, people started thinking about how to make a difference between container and the content. So in this case, we had one container that was able to hold multiple contents. 20 years ago, another thing happened. When you separate them, it also means that you can put one content into multiple containers. So, 20 years ago, not 22, um, Amazon started with um, the first Amazon web store. This is also an important part of the digitalization of the business. At that time, Amazon only sell, sold printed books, no e-books. But the e-book era started 22 years ago. And all of a sudden, you could imagine that you could use this one content in several types of books, in several types of machines, and on several types of screens. You could use it to print it on demand, which was also new at that time, which means that the bookstores didn't have to have a lot of books on stock. Um, you could order it and then print it and then deliver it the next day. Of course, this was the preparation for delivering products like the iBooks, um, eBooks in general, PeeBooks, which is printed books, print on demand, or the Kindle. And in this case, the added value comes from the freedom of the content, the liberation of the content from its container. Ten years ago, more or less ten years ago, it's hard to define that. Exactly. Multi-format publishing and content publishing coming out of databases um, were getting bigger and bigger in the industry. And they built the foundation for products that using atomized <coughs> content. When I'm talking about atomized content, what I mean is it's the smallest reasonable content module that can be combined to any possible content product content module can be an image, it can be uh, an abstract, it can be a paragraph of a text that can be recombined. So the business model, if you have atomized content in a database, the business models can shift towards a melange of services and, and, and products that you could combine in all different ways for all different um, formats and, um, and also screens. It also opens up the market for new players because if you have a database with content and you give access to that database to any company, that company can create a new product um, and use it, for example, if you grab access to your database to Audi, they can use the content in their cars and have it as ebooks or whatever in their cars. So this was a very, very short um, view on the content. Let's have a short view on the value chain. For 3,500 years, the value chain was more or less like this. You have the author who writes the book. The publisher selects, he buys the right to publish it, he refines it, he publishes it, he produces it, and he brings the book to the markets. Then the distributor holds the books for many publishers on stock and distributes <coughs> them to the bookstores. The stores themselves recommend to the readers, they sell it, and sometimes they deliver it to the reader's homes. The reader buys the book and he enjoys it. For 3,500 years, the need for technology was very low. If you had desktop publishing and digital printing involved, that was basically enough to fulfill that part of the value chain. Now, let's see what happens when the digital product is introduced and when content is liberated from the container. As I said before, 20 years ago, Amazon was founded as an online bookstore in 1994. In 1995, they sold their first actual book. And in this case, when the value chain is disrupted a bit, um, the author can sell the rights to publish to a publisher, as he did before. He could also sell the rights to an online store that also publishes, like Amazon, who became one of the biggest publishers. He could produce the book him or herself and sell it through any ebook store in this world. 
or to any uh, print-on-demand provider, or he sells it directly to the reader. So we have five different business models if we only look at the author. The publisher now often sells the book, the e-books, directly through his own online store. Doesn't need any more distributors or other people's online stores if they have their own. And he can dismiss that part of the chain. The distributors now offers additional services like metadata handling. We're going to talk about metadata a bit later in order to maintain part of the value chain. And they became sort of multi-service companies for the whole industry. Some of the bookstores died, unfortunately, like Borders, the ones we talked about before, or they invent themselves new. Independent bookstores are doing pretty well at this moment. Amazon is also doing pretty well. Middle-sized chains are not doing pretty well. So they're the ones who are having a hard time at this moment. And if you look at that, um, value chain, the technology level has increased, the production process is completely digital in this case, and um, can be used for many products. Now, this is not actually a value chain anymore. Um, it is an image that, we, that I took out of a presentation for, um, from Frank the Book there two years ago, and it showed the publishing ecosystem with all its different parts um, right now, and you can see that this looks like chaos. It's everything is atomized. There is a um, million possible business model in this image, and this was possible because um, of database publishing and because of the XML workflow that was introduced to most publishing houses at this moment. And what I would like to discuss with you today in the following <coughs> sorry in the following screens is what this means for the industry and what it means for the roles and for the different parts of value creation if you look at the author, the publisher, the product, the distribution channels, and also the reader. But maybe to make everything very easy to sum it all up in the beginning, if the content is liberated from the container, and if you add context to it, then you can create added value and you have a multitude of possible business models. If, by the way, if there are any, any, any websites or I mentioned any links or studies or whatever, in the end you find the link um, where, I, um, where I posted all the links from this presentation. Let's look at the author on the beginning. Um, there are three important change areas for authors and how they interact with the industry. Probably the most disrupting force was the introduction of self Authors can choose which part of value creation they want to do by themselves if they self-publish or which part they want to outsource to service providers. Take for example proofreading, editing, cover design, metadata, creation. The author can do all that by, by himself or he could outsource it. The biggest self-publishing authors can make a lot of money. Do you know Honey Moonson? Who knows Honey Moonson? Well, you should know her. She's a bestseller. She's a German self-publishing author. She sold 320,000 copies, e-book copies, of her book, Honig Tod, Honey Death, and 9,000 paperbacks. She was leading the Amazon e-book sales charts for a few weeks, and she earned at least 300,000 euros for that one novel she published with Amazon so far. The book costs around 3 euro, 2.99 actually, and she keeps 70% of the sales. So she's the lucky one, but the majority of self-publishing authors, they earn a few euro per month. So if you think about changing into that business, you should be really good. Self-publishing leads to more economic uncertainty on the author's side, because the author is not employed doesn't get a fee up front anymore, like in former times, because there was a publisher maybe who believed in the author and in the new book of the author. Now the author has to write the book and then sell it. But of course, it also means that there's a chance to be published for many, many authors that were neglected by the publishers before. If you look at the Amazon sales charts, you will find out that um, 
the 10 best-selling books of Amazon are always Amazon self-published Kindle formats. So um, these are the million books. Of course, this also leads to many, many more titles being published. And actually, we are entering an era of the author. There are more authors than readers. Um, and there are more written and sold books than time to read all these books. Many companies, many publishing companies also want to be part of the self-publishing era, which is sort of weird if you think about it. But then, what is a publisher? A publisher makes money out of published books. So it's just a different value, a different form of value creation for them. Holzbank, which is one of the biggest German publishing houses, they invested a lot into um, self-publishing service so called ePubli pretty early. All the others did themselves. The Amazon service is called Kindle Direct Print. And um, many small companies are right now offering different services for self-publishing authors from proofreading to um, conversion of ebook formats for the different um, stores. So there's a whole new ecosystem building around um, the self-publishing authors. And we can say that self-publishing actually strengthened the role of the author within the value chain. The second important um, change is co-production, co-creation. If we think at um, book authors, we have Hemingway in our mind, the lonesome wolf who sits on his desk at a remote cabin at the sea and smokes a cigar and writes a book. <laughs> um, of course, we still have these authors, but um, there are more and more authors working in teams. And um, this means that we have a whole new product range of um, online services for co-production and co-creation um, that are used by authors, that are used by the publishers. And um, they make it possible to work from the beginning on together um, for a product, together with the illustrator, for example, or with the proofreaders, or with peer readers from the beginning on, or even with your audience from the beginning on, so you can get feedback without the book being published. This also influences the work itself. It gets more filtered and less edgy, I would say. It means that when you co-create or when you, when, you, when you talk to your audience uh, from, from the beginning on, um, you get less opinion, but you get, of course, more knowledge and more variety of topics. The connection to the reader is probably the most influential part of that, and I put it together with fan fiction. Um, the connection to the reader is getting pretty close for um, most authors. Thanks to online and uh, social media, many authors involve their audience from the beginning on, and publishers expect their authors, even if they're not self-published, um, to build a fan base, to connect with them in social media. Since this connection is part of the original marketing, Parts of the marketing is shifting from the publisher to the author. The duties, but also the power, shifts to the author, which means that authors who have a great fan base um, can move from one publisher to the other without losing their fans, which wasn't possible um, in former times. So the author as a brand is becoming more and more important. Sometimes this connection to the reader also can blur the the idea of the product itself. If um, you all know J.K. Rowling, of course, and you all know Harry Potter, and um, at the end, after the seventh novel, I think, um, J.K. Rowling introduced Potter World. And Potter World was a completely new product. There was no publisher involved at all. It was an online community around Harry Potter, around the characters, around the books. And, um, <coughs> You can imagine that you charge a subscription fee for fans to be involved into the stories after they finish the book, to buy merchandise goods, to interact with each other, to write fan fiction, probably. It's also a place where fan fiction around Harry Potter can be published. Um, and um, this means that for an author who builds a very strong brand for himself, 
and also builds a very strong brand about the title or the, the, the character um, that he invented, um, this also can be a whole new business. The author has a lot more power in this value creation. Do you know Fifty Shades of Grey? Who read it? Oh, you're the brave one. Um, <laughs> st statistically, I think 20% of you must have read it. Um, do you know that it was initially published as fan fiction? It was um, fan fiction for um, Stephanie Meyer's Twilight um, saga. And um, we can also see that in this case, out of fan fiction, self published fan fiction, a world bestseller um, can rise. And um, it's funny that even with um, all these new self publishing tools and all the new power that authors have in the self publishing world, the only thing they want to be is listed at publishing house. So publishing houses still have the role for many authors of being the gatekeeper to quality. And I think this is going to be like that for a few more years. Let's look at the publisher. For publishers, what changed within the last years is the rights and licenses business, the owning IP or creating IP, IP is intellectual property business. Um, they could diversify into other media, they could become solution providers, they find new competitors, and I also added the fixed prices, even if the fixed prices aren't changing at this moment. So let's start with the rights. Um, the shift from the book object to the content product brings an invisible but incredibly important change for the whole industry. That is, when you buy a printed book, you own the object in the end. When you buy an e-book, you don't own anything. You buy the right to read that e-book, to use the content within an agreed time and within an agreed technical framework. Outside of that, you don't own anything. So, with the last hundreds of years, um, publishers have built a system of rights and license trade where agents and publishers um, interacted and were trading the distribution rights for several regions and also several language editions. With digital products, this leads to a weird situation. For example, if you want to buy an English ebook, why go to the German ebook store? that sells that ebook one year after it's been published in the US, pay a higher price in Germany, and get the same book that you could have bought for a cheaper price one year ago in the US ebook store. And of course, you can do it, because it's all online. Yeah. For the publisher, the situation is completely different, because the publisher bought at some point the right to sell that ebook for the German market, and he paid a lot of money for it. So if all of you are going to buy the product directly from the US, that publisher is not going to invest into any more licenses. Um, so he's getting he's driven out of that business. That's not your fault, of course, because you only want to read the book. But it shows how you as the buyer or as the user are interacting directly with um, the publisher's uh, revenues, in this case, even if um, you don't mean to harm to them. Um, so the what I'm saying is that the rights and license system is changing at the moment, but the players haven't changed yet. And the players are still finding new solutions for that. Because the publishers, they're not interested in not giving you the right to read that book for you. They want to offer that, but the industry had been like this for several hundred years, and it's hard to change that system. For publishers, it also means a lot of investment to new technical infrastructures in the beginning, but what they hope is that they have lower production costs in the end for ebooks in the long run. This is also the reason why ebook prices are still, or the reason that publishers claim why ebook prices are still almost as high as printed book prices, because they're saying they're having the investments and also only 10% of the costs of the book are related to printing and stock. Which brings me to the second part, owning the IP and having a new business for the publishers. Originally, you remember the author is selling the right to 
use that IP to the publisher. Now, what happens if the publisher owns and creates his own IP, intellectual property? They have more rights to do with it whatever they want to. Take the Harry Potter case. A publisher would buy one, the first Harry Potter, then it's a success, then the agent would sell the second Harry Potter for a very high price, and in the end, the price for that right is incredibly high, and then you don't own anything but the right to publish that book. If you think about the movies, the audiobooks, the whatever, it's all different rights. So, many publishers are investing at this moment into creating their own intellectual property and creating more success um, for their own company by owning the characters, owning the stories themselves. I'm going to show you two examples after that. One is Bastai Lübel, German publisher, and the other one is Böttinger, British or also German, children's book publishing house. Publisher can also become solution provider. If you talk to Scholastic, which is one of the biggest US education publishers, or Klett Verlag in Germany, it's the same. Um, what they are, they wouldn't say we are a publishing house. They would say we are a provide, solution provider for the education system. They know the needs of the target group, they own the content, and they ha are part of the system by being very, very closely connected to stakeholders in schools and governments and all that, which makes it very easy for them to develop new products like owning schools, running afternoon tutoring classes, run online tutoring systems, sell consulting to education providers, sell an education management system, for example, that schools or universities can use as software as a service. And they can extend their value creation horizontally, of course, but also vertically, like running the technical infrastructure for that. And um, if a publisher, like Klett or Scholastic, does this, they also have a new market and they also have completely new competitors they have to deal with. Um, there are um, I found two pretty interesting companies in, in, in education in Korea. One is called EBS. It's an edu um, education broadcasting system. And this company is something like Telecolleague in Germany, um, but it's something like Telecolleague on LSD because they run between eight and ten TV stations. They have billions of websites. They are their own publisher. They publish material like books, tests, everything. And within their system, you can learn English, whether you're five years old or 90 years old. If, you have, if you're 90 years old, you have your own English learning senior citizen TV channel with all the other materials around that. And you can learn math and other subjects. They started as a state-owned enterprise um, for providing additional education services. But in the meantime, they're one of the major educational publishers um, in Korea. So I found this really, really interesting because they're a direct competitor to a company like Scholastic, for example, but they come from a completely different background. Um, so if these two competitors are in the same market, offering the same services, but are coming from different backgrounds, they usually don't talk to each other. And this is something that um, we experience at Frankfurt Book Fair a lot of the times, that we've talked to companies like EBS, who come from television, and um, we say, well, you should come to Frankfurt Book Fair, because that's where people are who are looking for your services. They're like, no, but we're a television company. What are we doing at Frankfurt Book Fair? Um, so you see that the self-definition of these companies is also um, different. The other one is pretty nice, it's called English Egg. And they also run an education system on how to learn English for children. And they, um, the boss who founded English Egg, he was um, related to, um, the US, uh, to the US musical scene. And he's a big fan of musicals. And he thought, well, why not integrate musicals and English learning? So he created this whole system where children learn English by singing, by staging musicals um, in English learning musical classes in the afternoon. And he also developed e-books, websites, um, DVDs, um, classes, whatever. Again, coming from a completely different background, but offering the same services and the same products. 
the fixed prices. I, mention, I would like to mention them here um, because even if they are the one stable force in this, um, in this system, um, in Germany we have a fixed book price. In other countries like the US, we don't have it. And what it means is that one released form of the book has to have the same price at every store. It does not mean that the hardcover needs to have the same price as the ebook, because it's different release forms, but it means if you buy that book at Sylt, a remote island, it has to cost the same as if you buy it here at Hohenlubel in Berlin, for example. And what we see in countries that don't have the fixed book price is um, an interesting development. Because um, the booksellers are concentrating on only a few titles. Um, also big supermarkets are having these few titles. They're selling it for a very, very low price, which means that everybody else in the industry has to sell them for the same very low price, which means that the publisher are selling a lot of these few titles um, for a very low price, which also means that nobody else is selling other books, like special interest books. These special interest books now are becoming more and more expensive because they don't have a big buying community. And in the end, we have a, le we have a lower, smaller variety of titles, um, which if we think of the book not only as a commercial product, but as a cultural product as well, might be a problem for the country. And there are countries like um, Switzerland or Austria who were um, trying out to, to get rid of the book, fixed book price and then introduce it again and um, uh, countries are playing around with that at this moment. And of course publishers um, and also the bookstores um, don't like that. And um, in Germany everybody in the industry is pretty pretty happy and lucky that the German government is still um, holding on fixed book price because it also means in the end a variety of bookstores. And as I said before, the smaller bookstores are doing pretty well at this moment, this is also part of it, because um, you could go to any bookstore in Germany, you could order any book and you would have it the next day. But um, I promised to show you two companies, two publishing houses, who are um, who are creating their own IP. One is um, Bastai Lübbe, and um, Bastai Lübbe started as a pulp fiction publisher, Koschenhefte. Um, they have developed in the last years to multimedia house and here you can see that they're coming from print of course they have invested into digital media audio merchandising they bought games development company and they own uh, own tv production company and um, what they're trying to do is to sell 360 degree of one product of one story in this case the example is greg's diary from jeff kinney and um, if you own the rights, if you own the story for all of these formats, of course you can build a whole new system around that. And you can build whole new services around that. They also creating their own IP. This is, um, it doesn't look very appealing, I know. But um, it's pretty interesting because it's called Apocalypsis. And it's a book app. And uh, you download the app for free, you download the first chapter for free, and then um, you are um, subscribing to it, and you're getting a new chapter every week. But you're not only getting a new chapter of an ebook every week, you're also getting access to games, you're also getting access to other media like audio, videos, whatever. So whatever is possible within an app or within the iPhone can be done with this book and with this um, story. You can download it as, um, as a hörbuch, as an audio, audio book. Um, you have several versions of the book. You have the stripped down text only version in the end, or you have the version together with the apps. And all this was created by the company, not by an author. And it was created by an authoring team. So um, the production process that we know from TV series, for example, um, is being introduced here in a publishing house, which is something very, very new. And um, of course, this is something that needs new skills within the publishing house itself. So they have 
if you look if you look at their website, Astelube, they have right now three or four of these um, different story worlds that they created. And I think they're pretty creative in inventing new things and new ideas. Um, the second example is Bettinger 34. Um, they have a different, they introduced a different um, new tool, which is a collaborative story development tool for digital creation. So Oettinger is one of the most important children's book publishers in Germany. They have a lot of illustrated books. And um, they invented that tool one year ago because they, use, they want to use it to do research on which topics are hot. They want to do research for talents, who are good illustrators, who are good writers. They want to try out new ways of production because this is a very fast production, the way of production. And they will also want to build a fan base among the creators um, who can be the authors or the illustrators of their books. If they just started one year ago with several projects, so what you do if you, if you are a creative, you <coughs> apply for access and then you suggest the story and then if they accept it, you can try, you, you can start to develop that story with um, different partners. And at the end, it will become a real product or not. So I think that decides at the end what to do with it, but of course you could easily think about adding self-publishing services in the end, so it becomes a book in any way. How am I time-wise, by the way? Late. The distributor. <coughs> the distributor is the middleman, and what do we know about middlemen in digital industries? They cut them out. So the former role of the distributor was to collect books from all printers and all publishers, distribute them within hours to all 6,000 bookstores in Germany, for example. With digital products, their role, that role became obsolete, of course. So they had two assets that they could pay. One was databases. They had very, very good databases of titles or metadata. Who does know what metadata is in books? Okay. A book has always a cloud of data that is, that is traveling with it. Um, and in that cloud of data, there's something like the author's name, the ISBN number, reviews, statistics on that book, um, the edition, and all that. So all the data that is needed to sell a book, or to, to store it, or to put it into a library, that is called the metadata. And um, the distributors had databases of that metadata. They had data on the clients, and also statistics on the trends and on the market itself. So if you combine these assets with the very strong process they have, the very strong delivery process, you could try to invent new services, digital services that you could offer to the whole industry. You could offer them to authors, self-publishing authors, you could support publishers like you did before. You could even build your own ebook store around that data and become a bookstore. Or you start your own retail business, um, like JD.com in China did. A few years ago, they were a big distributor, and um, then they became number three in, um, in, in of all the bookstores in China. They became number three before Amazon. Amazon was number four, and then number five. And um, they were good in that because they were the only ones who knew that in China, the post boxes in the homes are too small to deliver parcels, books. Yeah. Um, so the, um, the Chinese post wasn't able to deliver these parcels, but they were the only ones who, through the database, knew which shops were around, which hubs could be built around them, and they also knew why, because they, they knew about the, um, the ordering uh, process, where people work, so they could deliver books and parcels directly to people's offices. Um, this made them very strong, this data made them very strong, and then they became number three in the market. The bookstore, the poor guys, they have the biggest challenges. And of course, the biggest challenge is always Amazon when we talk about the book industry, because Amazon sets the pace. It owns right now 25% of the German retail market. As I said, it introduced the recommendation system very, very early because it didn't have any book sellers who could consult and could recommend titles. 
Um, it built a very convenient and closed ecosystem around the kitty It's very fast, very good delivery, like all other bookstores, but somehow no one knows it. Somehow people always think Amazon is cheaper and is faster than your regular bookstore around the corner. That's not true. Um, they're as fast and as cheap um, as the bookstore around the corner. But they use their market power to get much higher discounts from publishers, which helps them in their annual results, of course, a lot. Amazon has built many competitive advantages, and most of the chains, of the bookstore chains, um, didn't have those advantages. They tried, or for several years, they struggled to, to keep up with Amazon's pace, um, but um, most of the chains didn't, didn't succeed in that. Surprisingly, the independent stores are doing very well in most parts of the world. In the US, the number has increased 20%, 20% more independent bookstores since 2009. Why? Because they're selling books to a very selective audience. They know their books, they know their audience, and they're giving a neighborhood feeling that no other service um, could build. So this is one of the chances that <coughs> bookstores have to become sort of a neighborhood shop. Many of them have invested into multi-channel stores. They offer like mobile um, stores, physical, of course, and, and online. Most of them run recommendation newsletters, websites, and all that stuff. But the most important part is that they are a neighborhood cultural center. So the bookstore is becoming a cultural center. In Taiwan, for example, there's a system called the Book Cafe, which is exactly what it says, a combination of cafe and book store. And you go there, you read, you buy, you drink your coffee. And um, they are very, very successful. And no Amazon can offer that. And also, most of the big chains don't offer the cozy atmosphere of small Another strategy to become is for, for book sellers is to become a store for cultural goods. Dussmann did that a few years ago here in Berlin by selling DVDs, um, movies, music, and all that. In um, Taiwan, the, the biggest um, chain is called Is Life, and um, they're getting, going a step further. They're calling themselves a cultural goods store. And they're integrating um, things like design, clothes, books, music, games, kitchenware, everything. And they built little theme stores within the store. So they combine the kitchenware with the cookbooks, with the tea selection, and whatever. So it's also a new way of um, finding your place as a retailer in that business. Non books also becoming more important for all bookstores, they were important for um, many of the chains. Non-books are things like stationery, games, presents, all the tiny little things that you find near the catch desk. Or, to survive, you can work together with competitors and create something new. And um, this is another example I want to show you. It's Tolino. And um, Tolino is um, interesting because it started one and a half years ago. And um, it's four competitors, Talia, Weltbild, Google, Bertelsmann, the four major German booksellers going together, creating together with Deutsche Telekom a new product which is uh, an e-book reader called Tolino. They have different versions, they have a small tablet, um, one that is waterproof, and they also built an ecosystem around that, exactly like Amazon did. You can buy e-books at all the e-book stores that are related to the Tolino system. You can store them at the telecom cloud, and then you can read them all, regardless of where you bought them, on one device. And the difference to Amazon and Kindle is that you actually can keep the ebooks. Because at Amazon, if you get rid of your account, you don't have access to your books anymore. At the Tolino system, you can keep the books, so you sort of own it, um, which is a big advantage and which helped them to reach a market share in Germany, which is over 40% right now, and they're more, they have more market share than Amazon um, in the second year. They're right now um, opening stores in, in Austria, in, in Switzerland, in Belgium, and in Italy. So other countries are copying that system and um, think that it's interesting, or the, the industry of other countries, that they think it's interesting to build your own Kindle-like 
um, system with local advantages. <clears throat> so let's see how this um, is going to, to evolve. But I think it's really interesting, and, and um, the, the four partners are pretty happy that they did that step. And it was a heavy discussion, of course, because um, if you think about um, going into a system with your biggest competitor while at the same time um, you're having two TV ads. Um, one says buy your ebook at um, Talia, the other one says buy your ebook at uh, Baptist My Online Store. And you're spending a lot of money there. Um, it can be hard to make a decision like that to go together in, in, in a system like this. The most important part of the disruption of the value chain is, um, of course, the product. And I'm trying to make it shorter as I have compared it because it's like three pages. Mm -hmm. um, in most countries, ebooks account for between two and five percent of um, the total book space. If we talk about the book use, of course, these numbers would be um, higher because. Um, People are using a lot of digital products that, that weren't bought before. In the US, which has the biggest, biggest market, market share of ebooks, um, the, the share is about 20%. But compared with the little influence on sales, the cultural and structural influence of ebooks is enormous in the industry. So to create and to, 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 to sell an ebook, you, um, you have to have huge investments for production, distribution, and marketing. Of that. Um, you have we have debates about piracy and open access and about how to deal with new rights management. We have the invention of a complete new hardware genre, the, the ebook reader, for two or five percent of the market. Um, so what the industry is doing right now is they're betting on the future. But so far, no one knows where this is going to end. Um, what, what we see right now in the US and also in Germany is um, that after years with a steady growth of, of ebooks, we sort of um, flattening out at this moment, which probably means that at this moment, not more than 20% of all books want to be read um, digitally. If you look at the product features of ebooks that influence the value chain, uh, value chain, then of course um, the license model I mentioned that before is important from ownership to use, which also means that you cannot resell it or you cannot lend it to someone. Else. The instant sales process is important. You discover it, you buy it, you download it, you read it within two minutes. The ebook is interactable, much more like a printed book or a bigger um, system than the printed book. And when you introduce an ebook, you're also starting to collect big data. You're collecting data about the consumption and about the interaction of the reader with the book. So for example, um, Amazon knows which pages are exit pages or which page, pages are fast page turn pages. So they actually know which parts of the story are boring. But they don't tell us. They don't tell the publishers, they don't tell the readers, they don't tell anybody. And I think um, the reason for that is um, because they are afraid that we see how many pages of published books are actually irrelevant to the readers. And um, this would harm their own business. Um, ebooks are enhanceable. You could add other formats. Um, we saw that at uh, the Bastelle de case. The hardware, and I mentioned mobile before, is also um, a very interesting um, factor. Um, the biggest hardware product in the book industry is still the printed book in most parts of the world. And when it comes to ebooks at the moment, we have two different strategies. One is to read the book in an application on your smartphone or, or the laptop or a tablet. The other one is to use a dedicated device, mostly called ebook reader. And there are numerous systems um, around the world, um, Kindle being the biggest. Then we have the, the NOOC, Barnes & Noble in Germany, the Torino. And uh, the success factor for all these system is to build an ecosystem that contains the hardware, service, ease of access to the store, and recommendation system. Distraction and competition for consumption time has also big influence on the product within 
our value chain um, because the competition between different kinds of media is increasing. And um, I just read the Jim Studie about the German media usage. And the good news is that German children and young adults like to read books right after listening to music, using the internet, using the cell phone, and listening to the radio. Um, so the average reading time is right now 65 minutes per day, which is not bad, but it includes books that they read in school or the university. Um, so this means that less and less people, young people, um, are reading books for pleasure. And um, there's a great competition for the media consumption time. Um, at this moment, books maintain more or less stable. TV is losing a lot against YouTube. Um, every year more, and we'll see how that is going to evolve in the future. Um, another factor that I mentioned before is the exploding number of titles. Um, approximately, we have right now three times more titles than were published in 2005. In um, 2012, we had between one and two million titles being published worldwide in only one year. And um, of course, it's a big between 1 million and uh, 2 million, and why can't people give us a better number? Um, the reason for that is that there are many countries um, that have different systems of um, collecting the data, or don't have any system of collecting the data of those ebooks being sold or published. So we only have the guesses, but we know that it's a lot more than only a few years ago, and again, we have less time from readers, with more products and more books, and we're entering the age of the writer's dominance. Part of the product is the price, and um, if you look at prices in the industry right now, we also have chaos. We have countries where we have a fixed price, others where we don't have a fixed price. We have a fixed countries where we have a fixed price for books, but not for ebooks. We have a um, global ebook market that can be accessed from everywhere with different prices. And we have different pricing systems. So just to mention a few, we have the price per item. We have bundles. You buy the hardcover, and then you get access for free to the ebook. You have library lending, which actually means that you can access the book for free. We have subscription models like book clubs, or you could subscribe for X titles per month. We have subscription models for streaming books, something like Spotify for me. <coughs> I also have an example for that. And we have versioning. Um, you probably might know that. Chris Anderson, the former um, Wyatt um, the chief editor, when he sold his last book, when he distributed, he chose different formats. He had a free version that could only be read in a browser. He had a paid version that was a formatted ebook with contents. And he had a very, very long audio version that was also for free because he said, um, you can listen to the whole book for free, but if you don't have that time, you have to pay for a shorter more condensed um, version. I'm leaving out open access, I think, because this is um, far too heavy for a little bit of time that we're having. But I'm guessing that you are discussing open access in, here in the university um, quite a few times. The last part that I would like to talk about is discoverability, which means that with more and more titles being published, with more and more systems selling titles, with more and more systems that you could use to read the book, and with more and more apps, um, you completely lose control about which books you know, which books you want to read, which books you already read. And this is becoming a big problem. So this, the discoverability of new books and also the discoverability of your own books and the content of that book is a big unsolved problem because there's not a single system in this moment. In former times, the single system was the printed pages in your shelf. And right now you're having like 10 shelves and some of them contain printed books and others contain other uh, books. I mentioned that shortly ago, a streaming, something like a streaming books, um, streaming literature, um, something like Spotify for books. It's an um, example from Spain. It's called 24 Symbols. 
And what they do is stream book content to the browser for mobile content distribution. They have a freemium model, which means that you can start for free with some titles, but if you want to um, read more, you have to subscribe. Um, it's one of many new business models being evolved at the moment. I think this is five years old. Um, they're doing pretty good. Um, but we don't know which of these business models are going to succeed in the future and which of these companies is going to build a new standard for streaming books. This is another example for that, that deals with the problem of discoverability. It's called Two Reads. It's one year old. And um, they built a discovery engine for books by mapping the connections between books. So they're using semantic references and they're using the context of books by suggesting new books to you or by helping the publisher as a service to build their catalog, um, to, to, to show their catalog in new ways, in, in contextual ways to the reader. Last part, the reader. It can be very short about that because you're all reader. Um, the most important changing areas are the changing reading, reading habits and the reading time. You mentioned that before. The changing buying habits. If I see about a book or if I hear about a book at a conference, I want to buy it right now. And I'm also always very angry if I'm not able to do that. Um, mobile, I mentioned Korea as an example. But also always on means that this is the right time for offering streaming services that, could, that you could use without being online. We have um, an effect that is called simultaneous consumption of different types of media. People are watching TV while on the laptop uh, streaming YouTube and reading a book on the iPhone. Um, but of course this can be used. And um, it also means that you start reading your book as a hardcover in your bed and you, the next morning you go into the subway and want to follow up um, on your smartphone because you don't want to carry a printed book with you. So, also, this gives possible gives, gives room for possible business models and, and ways to deal with that. And the last, we have a low or no price expectation for all digital formats because that's what we learned on the web that everything's free. So ebooks should also um, be for free. And um, the average price that people are willing to pay for ebooks is dropping slowly. Um, if you remember Honey, the, the best-selling author from Amazon, her book is priced $2.99. So maybe in the end, um, that's what consumers are willing to pay for an e-book novel, $2.99. The disruption of the traditional value chain is leading to a growing publishing industry. To answer the question, um, is the publishing industry growing or is it not? I would say it is growing. But again, if you ask any publisher, they will tell you. Thank you very much. And you can find um, all the links at um, the Google Plus page. And um, now, if you're still awake, I'm happy to discuss.